Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming on a rainy, early Friday morning. We're very excited about this wonderful program. I'm going to briefly um, just uh, name who the presenters are. I'm not going to read you their illustrious bios. They are on the website and in the program, but in the interest of time, I'm told to keep a very tight schedule. Uh, our first speaker is Lama Abu Aude, who's a professor of law at Georgetown University. Second, Paul Amar, who just goes by Amar, who's an associate professor in global and international studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And our third speaker on the Egypt panel is Mina Khalil, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you. How does this work? Is it okay if I read from my chair? Yeah, I'd rather do that. <laughs> All right. Um, without further ado, um, I just want to say that um, I'm taking the privilege of being on the Egypt panel and not actually talking about Egypt. I, um, I, I take this privilege as a, a sort of a an old academic who's been around for a while and much older than most of you here in this room. So if you'd allow me this license, and without much ado. <clears throat> um, of late, intensified after the Arab Spring, but certainly dating before then, run-ins, altercations, quarrels, tussles, skirmishes, have taken place between US-based academics mostly ethnic migrants and activists in the Arab world. Online journals, Jadaliya being the most prominent, have staged such confrontations in which the Arab activist suddenly finds him or herself the object of a fierce attack. The attack, in its subdued mode, charges the activist of being the unwitting handmaiden of Western imperialist projects instrumentalized by things like the Gay International, the UN International, and the UN International, or as a naive participant in Western discourses that are engined by Islamophobia, such as homonationalism and femonationalism. I've actually been introduced to these terms only recently, so I'm totally behind, I think. In its vicious mode, the attack accuses the Arab activist of being illiterate, ignorant, mediocre, and worse still, uninformed of the latest knowledge discoveries seemingly happening exclusively within the hallways of US academia. Sometimes the activist is derogatorily called a native informant sometimes a commoditized member of the compradora of the South, a false poseur who, in order to make the Arab world appear modern and liberal, liberal in the eyes of the West through the medium of his or her activism, throws the Arab, the Muslim, Islam, to the salivating discursive dogs of the West. Sometimes the critic adopts a maximalist position and denies any validity to the type of local activism in question. The activist is charged with introducing into the Arab cultural scene identities that are foreign, inciting homophobic discourse through their activism, homophobia being a phenomenon that always postdates the act activism, never predates it, and scaring certain sexual practices away. Sometimes the critic, the US academic that is, and to give local weight to the critique, locates a local authentic, 
a Bedouin woman, for instance, who asserts exactly the opposite of what the activist is asserting. Honor is good. It is important, of course, that this authentic, selectively chosen by the critic to enunciate the truth of the matter, to belong to a marginal community, a Bedouin, a villager, always a woman, which is to be contrasted with the social class of the activist, typically urbane, middle or upper middle class, westernized, etc. The point is not to be missed. The local activist is an outsider thrice by virtue of his or her class per position, which is already westernized, by virtue of the outside discourses of oppression and grievance that the activist peddles, and by virtue of the international audience it seeks to impress. Sometimes the anti-imperialist critic adopts a less maximalist and a more compromising position in which the naive activist, the unwitting, uh, unwitting handmaid in a vampire, is offered help, advice, in how to pitch his or her cause there's always apparently some other cause to be thrown into the mix of the activist's causes, some qualifying factor, some reformulation of the source of the evil to rattle one's saber with, which the local activist seems to have missed, ignored, or misidentified that the critic from US academia is happy to offer for the local activist consideration always okay to talk about the evil state, never okay to talk about culture, remember that. To show that the critic is indeed in touch with the activist locality, and like the previous position, there's always a local other, this time not a marginal Bedouin woman, but an activist intellectual, who got this just right in the way the anti-imperialist likes it. Um, and that the activist in question is politely asked to refer to and be informed by this person. The seemingly compromising position, and when one looks closely at what is being offered for help, is in fact not helpful at all. On the one hand, the anti-imperialist demand for qualification and complexification, if the activist were to heed it seriously, threatens to diffuse the local activist intervention and deprive it of its local political bite, and on the other would seem to trap the local activist in endless second guessing of the anti-imperialist intentions. It is a maximalist position in disguise because it turns out that what the anti-imperialist wants is a moving target that the local activist is doomed never to attain. Needless to say, the activist deeming him or herself a progressive with sufficient left credentials, thank you, is at first stunned by the attack, which seems to come from nowhere, <coughs> nowhere that is relevant to their own local context, and then decidedly puzzled with their feelings really hurt. Many such activists are friends of mine, friends of mine. It is not just that life has been particular, it's not that life has been particularly easy for this activist. There is first one's family to deal with, the closet and all that. Then there is the social antagonism to the cause, either dressed in Islamic doctrinal garb or basic local dialect of gender and sexuality phobia. Then there is the local political left who had historically lined up its causes and sexuality rights can certainly wait as far as it is concerned. And then there is the random security state that alternates between finding one's sexuality a threat to public morality, a source of blackmail, an occasion for sexual favors, often coerced for its own personnel, and a temporary license can, that can be withdrawn any minute. And now this. Many activists feel that this is not an attack they can afford to ignore. If the anti-imperialist in their attack rely strongly on the idea that in, a glo in our globalized world, local discourses circulate globally, and so one needs to mind what one says, it is this very globalism that makes the anti-imperialist critique hard to fend off. Not because it is correct necessarily, but because US academic capital, especially of elite universities where some of these critics are employed, circuits 
within the same channels the global capital does. It has the power to attract graduate students from outside the, U the US, offer them faculty positions when they graduate, and return them back to the home they had left voluntarily and in search for professional ambition, this time as intellectuals weighted by US academic prestige. What is of note about these critics is that not only do they appear not to have had any history of political activism themselves, none appears to have come to the US, for instance, as an exile, escaping political persecution, but their leftism is of the academic type, where intervening in one's own professional discourse constitutes the limit of one's activism. But I would be remiss to attribute the weighty impact of their critique solely to the power of US academic capital. There is a sizable faction in the activist's own audience that welcomes such critiques, namely those that subscribe to nationalist and religious identity politics. There's an undeniable correspondence between the anti-imperialist line based in US academia and the local religious and nas nationalist positions antagonized by, by gender and sexuality politics. One shouldn't miss the irony here. If much of the anti-imperialist critique frets over the tyranny of modernity's identity project, its most privileged audience in the Arab world are precisely those who most subscribe to those identity projects. In this case, it's the religious and the nationalist. The activist response to the critic is sometimes terse and uncompromising. Sorry, you seem to under misunderstand my context, and I certainly need no lectures from you on how to be effective in my own side of intervention. But it is the charge of naive, naivete at best and collaboration at worst that makes the critique of the anti-imperialist have a bite that bites. It seems hard for the anti-imperialist to believe that local activists are as seasoned as they and that they come at the end of a line of political activism on the, in, the Arab, in the Arab world that is not only rich in its political interventions, but also intellectual ones. By the way, it was hard for the white men of the 40s and the 50s of the 20th century peddling modernization theories to believe that the tribal and religious Arab can be as sophisticated as they. So it appears now the anti-imperialist educated in the Metropolitan University seems to think that there's something the poor locals just don't get and that the big migrant brother or sister fortunate enough to receive such education is about to tell them. There is in fact a very rich history in the Arab world of intellectual activists interacting with Western textualities, accepting them, modifying them, challenging them, reproducing them, strategically deploying them, not merely as an intellectual exercise, but in the course of acting as social engage agents engaged in their own local struggles. If only the anti-imperialists care to know the complicated world of the local activists, the mobile and changing distance between them and their causes, and between their causes and their causes articulation. The lack of curiosity in the local activist complex universe is experienced by lo local activists as a form of dissing. As if once deemed a native informant, one is relegated to a place of condemnation. One is no better than a spy to be executed for acts of unspeakable treason. This is all the more striking since the anti-imperialists often appear to be incapable of a minimum institutional analysis, or as we lawyers like to call it, distributional analysis, when they look into the activist agendas. The distributional analysis would require one to go beyond discourse to externalize the rules that reside behind it. What those rules are trying to do, what they are pushing for, how those rules being advocated are designed to shift the established entitlements, privileges, wealth, and power in another direction how they seek to settle the social conflict differently, hopefully, for the benefit of those historically marginal. Once those rules are <coughs> foregrounded, all talk of authenticity, it seems to me, simply turns into mush. Thank you.
much. I'm not supposed to comment, but wow. Thank you, Lemma. <laughs> For people who um, aren't entirely sure what Lemma's uh, referring to, please do check out Jedalea online. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was fabulous. So let's see, let me get this thing up here. And uh, it begins with a bit of a transition uh, relating to what we were just launched into here. All right. Good? Okay. PowerPoint put together at 5.30 a.m. this morning. Let's do it. Okay, so uh, I am actually going to do something absolutely awful, like a country report on Egypt. I'm so glad <laughs> that, uh, you know, Lama and Mina did not uh, Took the, they took much more creative options. But anyway, and, and also because um, Scott Long is not here, who would have presented some amazing case studies. So I'm, I have to, of course, admit that some of the images and some of the cases I'm going to mention today are um, informed partially by Scott's work. Um, because it was being recorded, I'm not going to go through the list of all the Egyptian organizations that I've worked with for the last eight years. I lived in Egypt for eight years, and um, uh, and of course everything I learned came from the experience working with those organizations. I lived in Darul Ahmar for two years, Balnea for one year, Sayyid Zainab for one year, and now Abdelman and Riyadh on Ramzi Street during the post-revolutionary period, which of course was a very contentious space. So, um, so let me just launch into this, uh, looking at new querying formations in what I am very roughly uh, theorized as a Gulf-occupied Egypt. <laughs> Basically throwing out the idea that what we are seeing now is this regional war in which Egypt and Saudi Arabia, I would roughly say, have merged into one country, basically. And we have this ring of fire around it, Libya, Yemen, ISIS conflicts around Gaza, which are being I think are kind of the, again, the edge of what obviously a lot of people talk about as a regional war, but specifically the results of um, a merger between Egyptian military and the Saudi Kuwaiti capital and their attempt to consolidate an unconsolidatable and depopulated and um, socially unsustainable regime in this region. So I'm going to be talking about the sexual biopolitics and the morality identity politics that are attempting to be created as, again, an unsustainable and very violent foundation for this new regime, merging particular oligarchical interests in Egypt and Saudi Arabia, and of course, formations of securitization and militarization. So queering the production of perverse subjects, as well as queering, meaning the revolutionary dissidence that emerges in resistance to these new formations, I'll be talking about in several different ways here. Very loose not at all, and a very preliminary set of analyses here, grossly um, simple in some ways. So what I'm not gonna talk about here, and thank you, Lama, for devastating the territory upon which anyone would want to try to stake claims based upon examining these crises and conflicts around sexuality and morality politics in Egypt as a s conflict between an imperialist West and their collaborators amongst the liberal Egyptian NGO class. I'm certainly not gonna be interested at all in framing any of these crises that way. Um, for this reason, I'm going to not, of course, focus on what has been the most famous case in the last two years, um, and that has been the gay marriage video and trials that followed that, in which men were um, arrested who had participated in a party vote in which they playfully simulated marriage rights or something of the like. And that became by far the most large, the cover, most covered story in the Western media in, this, in the age of the CC moral panic. Um, and of course that's because it just very simply took up the misframings of the Queen Boat case, which was also a case of a raid on a boat in the Nile um, in which the, the state and the tabloid media um, portrayed certain forms of debauchery and blasphemy um, in the context of an attempt to socially cleanse and transform the political economy of investment 
as I talk about in my book, that Void was the real story in the 2000, 2000, 2001 period was an attempt of the police in league with new Saudi investors in the area to clean up working class social spaces owned by women, by Egyptian women capitalists who owned these boats on the Nile, who owned the nightclubs and cabarets on Pyramids Road. And there was an attempt to take away their property rights and to clean up uh, the sex work economies in these areas in order to implant new five-star Saudi residential and hotel developments. And so I talk about that as a completely different set of redistribution policies that then the, the framing of these issues as um, the gay international versus the pious nationalists or the police state missed out on. So again, I'm gonna not repeat kind of these frames and I'm gonna instead turn again to looking at new kinds of um, sexuality struggles and morality panics that, have been, um, that are being unleashed in Egypt and that are certainly instrumentalized by groups that frame things such as the Western imperialism as their object, but which underneath them are operating a, a really, I would say, a brand new set of political, economic, and political institutional structures. My argument is that the Sisi era is not a return to a Nasserist period or a Sadat period. It's not the return to the same military bureaucratic apparatus mixing authoritarian and perhaps populist policies, but in fact it's a brand new kind of order, a post-neoliberal oligarchical order mixing again, uh, uh, the Saudi capital and the Egyptian military is a particular kind of infrastructure contractor and social control agent that actually has no interest whatsoever in the Egyptian population as citizens and only has interest in the Egyptian territory as a set of infrastructure sites and possible resource and trade route developments. So, looking basically at the sexual biopolitics of this idea of a marriage between Saudi Arabia and Egypt, the particularly close relationship between Salman and Sisi, cemented in the recent conference in Sharm el Sheikh, in which Saudi Arabia pledged $500 billion, basically bought the government of Egypt. Well, not the there is no government of Egypt, bought the military of Egypt for $500 billion dollars. They bought the Lebanese army three years ago for five billion. So Egypt at least held out <laughs> for five hundred billion dollars, right? I was talking about this last week at the University of Arizona. The University of Arizona's entire yearly budget to do run all the football stadiums and everything and all this is just under a billion dollars. So imagine five hundred years of a scale of operations like that, what that would imply. So, but I don't just want to look at this as geopolitics. I think the, the only reason why this exists and why this succeeds is because of the, the biopolitics that legitimates desire and fear for this regime on the ground through the animation and the terrorization of bodies, as we all know on some level. So let me talk about some of these projects. Some of you, of course, know very, all of you, I'm sure, know very well as specialists. <clears throat> but just to kind of see how they line up together in terms of new logics, of this new Saudi Egyptian uh, megastate. Um, so first of all, there's this rebirth, of course, of the notion of futurity. Futurity, which is always talked about in relation to mega projects or mega infrastructure projects. No longer in terms of talking about the new man or about the social development or about the construction of a new model of, of, of the peasant and rural development or the city citizen and urban transformation, all those terms of modernity that were associated with futurity in the modernization theory period. Now we have a futurity which is attached specifically to technology, mega projects, and as I'll talk about, there is an affective dimension. Of, ironically, it's not about Islam or piety or even nationalism, it's Sisi talks about this futurity as being enveloped in, in a misty cloud of love, as a, which we'll talk about. Love is the way this is going to be processed. But anyway, so we, we heard about last year, of course, the military in Egypt, alhamdulillah, had finally cured, cured AIDS and Hep C and I think diarrhea. They're all in one back package or something. <laughs> so <laughs> through these, these machines that they obviously like got on the internet made by Atari in like 1981, 
they, they were going to cure AIDS by pointing a, uh, a, a like divining rod that you used to find like water in your mold infested house or something like that. A divining rod that was going to find a magnetic level pulse in someone's body and that particular magnetic pulse was the magnetic cry of the HIV virus and then you'd attach, be attached to this lovely little R2-D2 robot over there who would suck out all of your blood, magnetically recharge it, which somehow got rid of AIDS and Hep C and diarrhea and headaches, and would then be put back into your body. So it was this strange kind of vampire machine you somehow managed to survive when all your blood sucked out in the place. But what it you know, led to this idea that military officers would be walking through the streets with these sticks that would like start to hum whenever an effeminate boy would walk past one of those sticks and then they would be brought in to have all their blood sucked out and replaced. And so this was of course celebrated as a wonderful success. And they actually talked about it very seriously for months. And they called the complete cure device, right? So um, finally they gave up on trying to say this was a real thing, but what it did was it demonstrated very much this new science technology, this kind of zombie version of 1950s sci-fi military authoritarianism that existed back in the 50s, of course, in Brazil and, I mean, in, in many other countries, not just Egypt, including the Latin American military societies, etc. But reviving it in this new way, focusing on sexuality, but not exactly, in this, not, not at all in terms of targeting homosexuals for Roundup, but again, as a, as a broader set of scientific cures for deviant forms of, of disease-ridden bodies, but, but through this kind of therapeutic rescue, high sci-fi framing. Now we all know, of course, also about the, the raids on the neighboring Ramses uh, bathhouse. Um, and this is because, again, we could frame it just as an anti-gay crusade, um, but the way it was operationalized and the way it was represented, of course, when it was led by Mona Iraqi, a, jur a tabloid journalist, and kind of one of these new women, upper middle class kind of thugs that uh, are organized around Sisi and that lead kind of these crusading morality campaigns in the media in order that kind of, in my view, simply it's kind of this desperate attempt for some of the Egyptian middle classes to find a new role for an activist citizen that will appeal to the state and its projects. When the state and its projects, these huge new canals, these ridiculous new ideas for our capital city, which is just gonna be some enormous shopping mall to profit Saudi and Dubai based, but investment companies. The new Suez Canal that CC's building is actually already owned by the Duport, Dubai Ports company, which is a private company. They got, it was previously owned by Qatar Ports, which is a private company, but Qatar Ports was kicked out of Egypt and is now building a port of Gaza. The military project, we, they revived Toshka, which is wholly owned, been sold off privately. Toshka, the second branch of the Nile, has been wholly sold off to Saudi private agribusiness companies. So these huge developments are freaking out the middle classes and upper middle classes in Egypt, as well as obviously many of the working classes that I think, so these morality projects, these moral rescue projects, I'm reading as a way that these upper middle classes are trying desperately to find a role for themselves, and it is as informants, and it is on entrepren as entrepreneurial, um, uh, uh, you know, kind of police agents working through gender and morality as their kind of way to grab populism and salvage a role for the middle class in this Saudi military conundrum. So Mona Iraqi, if we don't, if you don't know this case, you know, invaded this bathhouse with cameras rolling in, but her campaign was not to cleanse Egypt of Western influence, it was to stop sex trafficking, right? She thought of these men as sex trafficking victims who had trafficked themselves. Basically sex trafficking for, you know, right wing uh, feminists is the term they use for prostitution or for any kind of public sexuality. So to save these men from sex trafficking was the new logic. Now Egypt is not, uh, before Mossad says that sex trafficking is the new internationalism promoted by gays or feminists or whatever it is. No, sex, the, the discourse of sex, traf of sex trafficking and stopping 
um, sex trafficking actually started in Egypt before it started even in the United States and Europe. Um, the Egyptian campaign against white slavery, the Egyptian campaign to stop the trafficking in prostitutes began in the 19th century, actually has a very interesting history. Egypt is actually a, a pioneer in these kind of morality crusade politics. It's not something that came from the outside. It's an interesting case. One could actually argue that the white, anti-white slave campaign began in Egypt, not in um, England and the United States, as is usually assumed. But anyway, that's a whole long, other long story. But so there is a history of middle middle class crusading <coughs> women that I think of as as the kind of right wing um, social crusaders that has been revived in this current period. We also know, of course, kind of part of this kind of right wing morality entrepreneurs coming out of pseudo feminists that are working with the authoritarian populists. You know, we have also this whole circus of queering and sexual demonization of, of, of a tight mix of three targets. One being the United States as the kind of failed emasculated empire, which is racialized ju just as in Fox News style, as Obama as a perverse Muslim, as a perverse African Muslim, the blackness is always underlined. And this ties into the new explosion of targeting of Shia Egyptians, and there's like 15 of them in the country, but somehow they're headlines every day. The targeting of Shia Egyptians as perverse, sometimes Africanized, sometimes uh, always portrayed as having sexually excessive, orgy-style religious practices that merit their targeting as um, uh, perversions threatening the state. So we have this strange mix of the targeting of, of uh, portrayal of the American empire as a racialized, sex, sex, sexually excessive form of black Muslim, and that the kind of using almost the same metaphors to now target Shia in the country. And of course, this link that CC establishes between Obama, Iran, and the Muslim brothers, um, you know, becomes then a kind of uh, target of sexual and racial representation and a kind of populist mobilization in really twisted ways. So we all know how this kind of um, politics of, uh, of uh, rounding up new populist fervor uh, has also put CC into the position of trying to appropriate feminist politics around the um, attempts to roll back sexual harassment in the streets. It was the case of CC going to visit a woman um, raped and sexually assaulted during his inauguration speeches. He's tried to pick up on this sexual harassment law, but in order to turn it back around, in order to turn sexual harassment law into a tool for him to police working class um, children and youth in the city streets of Cairo during protests. So he uses that again kind of as a way to turn protection of women against sexual harassment into a tool to target the predatory sexuality of harassing youth in downtown Cairo. So we have a layer upon layer of, of um, different kinds of discourses around um, the production of a new kind of state apparatus, produce a new kind of infrastructure and building and contracting projects, but every single one of them has an, has an orbit of new morality campaigns that are generated around it. And these, for specific reasons, that they facilitate a new relationship to this, this, this middle class uh, right wing actors, and also that displaces the figure of citizenship in, um, as an object of the Egyptian state. All right, so I gotta get fast here. All right, so what are some, a couple other things that allow us to get out of the box of seeing sexuality politics, politics in Egypt as uh, the international versus local or east versus west? Well, what's, <coughs> what's been a big shift in the past couple of years has been a, that the regular um, policing of vice in Cairo has shifted from one of look, policing women as prostitutes or policing maybe occasionally um, men as debaucherers and blasphemers, and now it's shifted towards um, arresting trans men or effeminate men or lady boys as um, illegal labor migrants or as people that are working in the wrong spaces. They're working as prostitutes in a shopping mall or they're working in parties and they're, or they're migrating from the wrong space, from the wrong class, across class boundaries. So, but basically, I'm seeing that this is very much a standard transferal 
of, kind of Saudi and Emirati ways of policing sexuality, which focus obsessively upon ladyboy labor migrants as their number one target in terms of policing of sexual deviance. These ladyboy li labor migrants in shopping spaces, in party spaces, on public transportation. So this model of Gulf policing that has been transposed into Egypt, where it didn't exist on anything like this level before. So again, we're seeing this kind of gulfification of these um, um, sexuality campaigns. We're seeing the particular um, mobilization again of this combination of attacks against um, Shias and this image of the American empire, which um, portrays, again, Obama as a um, perverse Muslim, while at the same time targets the women representatives of the United States, whether it's Ann Patterson or Hillary Clinton, as these kind of, you know, bitch whores, constantly using these terms. Um, so there's been other representations of the kind of queer shifts in political culture since the rise of the military, first alongside the brothers and then very much against the brothers, and what kind of perverse implications that has for the moral, moral public sphere in Egypt. There's me posing with Morsi as queen, thrown down to the political destiny of Egypt by the joker of the revolution. So there's this history during the Morsi period, putting Morsi as a, as a queen who is hiding, a, who behind the makeup is hiding a more demonic, a more, or at least a trickster agenda, a secret agenda. Um, so one, and I'm sorry, this is just jumping all over the place, but finally one of the most important um, queer subjects in the last period has been the figures of uh, mass children's protests, whether it's the younger factions of the ultras, or young children taking over their primary and secondary schools, or street children that are mobilized in order to take over neighborhoods, and I've been writing about this lately, and of course it's no coincidence that they often take over the very sites of these new mega projects and infrastructure developments that are the very heart of the landscape of futurity produced by the Saudi Egyptian alliance. So, but these, so these children for me kind of represent the claims of the people and of the street that no longer have a place in this new polished high tech mega project vision of this Saudi Egyptian state whose objects of rule are these big boondoggle projects, their objects of rule are not the people. They have no project for the citizen or for the people. They only have projects for projects uh, on their own terms. So then people are inserting themselves and often massive, masses of children's children become the people that then manage to materialize in these spaces and are being targeted more and more violently. All right, got it up. So there you go. So the new alliance of forces is this new political economy, re regionalism, merging Saudi Arabia and Egypt, moving from citizenship as the object of the state to mega projects, the object of the state, through depopulation, this internationalism. Didn't get to talk about the love doctrine, but this is the idea that CC is replacing the school curriculum in Egypt with something called the love curriculum. In his own speeches, he has articulated the love doctrine, where we love the state erotically, passionately, in a way, that suspends our ability to make claims and finally middle class morality crusades from the right wing as they try to desperately find themselves in a post-citizen order. But we have to remember that all these formations here that we mentioned are driven by the fact that a revolution has taken place and is constantly on the verge of re-emerging. That there were in 2011 entirely different forms of sociability, different forms of gendered expressivity, different forms of um, class and youth appropriations, takeovers in the Sufi uh, institutions and in the Christian um, institutions in Egypt. And so that really put all these forces on um, defensive and made them go outside to Saudi Arabia for help. So again, the demands and the pressure for an alternative still exists. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now I'm happy to introduce Mina Khalil. Thank you. Yeah, last presenter on the panel. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, and Paul, after that, uh, mine is going to be so boring, so maybe you should go get some coffee or something. <laughs> um, all right. So I'm going to talk today a bit about history and a bit about law. Uh, I'm going to take you way back. 
<laughs> All right, so uh, I'm going to read it because it's just, you know, some of it is technical, but uh, yeah. Sa Same-sex sexual relations have traditionally been punished severely by most schools of Islamic jurisprudence and continue to be punished today under the penal codes of most states in the Middle East. Traditionally viewed as a uh, violation against the claim of God, or Hukuk Allah, uh, same-sex sexual conduct uh, could categorically fall within Islamic law's proscription of zina, or illicit sexual intercourse outside of marriage, strictly defined as between a man and a woman. Therefore, under Islamic law, lawat, uh, uh, same sexual conduct, uh, like zina, is immoral conduct that implicates both criminal and family law, which have developed as public law intended for the protection of social welfare and public morality, and which remains distinct from private law of contracts with its more demanding evidentiary rules and specialized courts. Uh, this public or social view of punishing homosexual conduct uh, ordinarily performed in the private sphere between consenting the consenting adults, however, is not unique to Islamic law and society, but rather was simultaneously accepted by European law during the Middle Ages and later codified in European penal codes that influenced, if not transplanted, the indigenous law of colonized, including Muslim societies. Forward-looking in the spirit of this conference, the question I am presenting here today is why modern states in the Middle East have continued to punish same-sex sexual relations while some of their Western and Eastern counterparts have moved to decriminalize such relations and some have begun to recognize them even in marriage. As US governing bodies have recently called upon all nation states to decriminalize same -sex, a consensual same-sex conduct, chronic criminalization of such conduct in Muslim states manifests a potential conflict between traditional Islamic norms and universal human rights in a contemporary milieu where the latter have or ex are expected to have an increasing influence on legal, if not also, on social norms. To ask this question, it is not to be assumed that Islamic societies must have the same trajectory as Western or other states in their own legal development on issues of sexuality and their definition of individual rights. Nor is it assumed that Islamic law or Muslim society is static and incapable of change. Rather, I am art articulating this question in light of the significant transnational influence brought by European colonization to the Middle East, namely in the 19th and 20th centuries, and the substantial legal and social developments manifested in the codified law and the social <coughs> rights in decolonized Muslim nation states in the Middle East. To explore this question, I want to begin by the story of the treatment of same-sex sexual relations much earlier, through a discussion of these relations across classical Islamic schools of thought, but I also want to try to piece together the experience of such relations in Egypt and under Egyptian law as early as the Mamluk period. Uh, so it's real, I, when I said like, I'm going to go back, I really meant going back. Uh, I think this is important in order to appreciate the inertia rooted in legal precedent and social norms it feeds and which feed it that persist against same-sex sexual relations in Egypt today, even if I do not intend to straightjacket Egyptian society to its past social practices. And if we are to seriously imagine queer sexualities in Egypt and the Middle East, then understanding these legal precedents and how they affected individual lives in Egypt's past seems to me to be a requisite first step. Yet, ultimately, Egypt is a good point of departure for our conference, at least from my perspective of legal comparison, for two main reasons. First, it pioneered the al sanburis Egyptian Civil Code of 1948, uh, or through the Sanburis Code, the modernization and codification of Islamic law in, on contracts uh, became the model for civil law in all modern Arab states. 
but more importantly, Egypt constitutionally defined in its Article 2 of its 1971 constitution the principal role of Islamic jurisprudence in guiding national legislation, including personal status and penal codes. This constitutional move has been followed by almost all Arab states in the Middle East in articulating sources of uh, legislative authority and subsequently in influencing their own family and criminal laws, including their punishment of same-sex sexual conduct. All right. So given the modern constitutional importance of fiqh or classical Islamic jurisprudence on family and criminal law in Muslim states in the Middle East, it is perhaps important to discuss its views on same-sex uh, sexual relations uh, and this term I use that's obviously up for debate which could categorically fall within or between these two areas of laws. While the majority of classical Islamic legal schools or madhabs, the Malikis, the Hanbalis, and the Shafi'is uh, prescribe same-sex sexual conduct as a had or a capital offense with a fixed punishment, some, including the Hanafi, uh, the Hanafi school mainly, held it to be a ta'zir offense, so whose punishment is left within the judge's discretion. The key to the classification is whether such conduct is to be equated to unlawful heterosexual intercourse and thus punished because it deteriorates the social institutions of marriage and family and causes social harm. While the majority of classical jurists answer this question affirmatively, Abu Hanifa and the majority of his school did not viewing that conduct as naturally and legally distinct from adultery or fornication. Under Sharia, sexual intercourse is only permitted within marriage and concubinage. Uh, illicit sexual intercourse defined as actual penetration by the man into the woman's vagina outside of legitimate marriage and concubinage is prohibited and punished severely as a hat crime or a zina. Adultery by a married adult Muslim or muhsin uh, warrants greater punishment than fornication by a non-married person, a non-muhsin, where the non-muhsin receives 100 lashes and exile for unlawful sexual intercourse. The muhsin, according to most schools, must be stoned to death. Since the principal purpose of the institution of hat crimes is deterrence from acts that are harmful to humanity, uh, this difference in punishment for the adulterer and fornicator is likely rooted in the perceived social harm that results from their conduct. Arguably, premarital sex is less socially harmful than extramarital sex because the latter occurs when marriage and family have been established and the social harms that may result from out of, led, out of wedlock children or spousal jealousies could cause greater harm in society that would be the case and that would not be the case in premarital sex. Uh, in spite of potential differences in resulting social harms, most madhabs equated homosexual intercourse with penetration to the hat crime of unlawful heterosexual intercourse and therefore punished it as severely as heterosexual adultery. The Malachites, the Shiites, and some Shafites and Hanbalites believe that a person accused of homosexual conduct, the active or the passive, must be put to death by stoning, sword, or burning, based on the rationale of hat punishment as a deterrent of social harm we may surmise that these jurists believe that the social harms of homosexual conduct were even more grave than the social harms of illicit sexual intercourse by the non muhsin Nevertheless, some jurists within the Shafi'i and Hanbali school did not accept this rationale and only applied the death penalty to those who are muhsin or the active partner. In a similar vein, the Hanafites, applying a more rational legal method, I would argue, uh, did not treat same-sex sexual intercourse as a hat crime altogether, but instead as a ta'zir offense punished within the judge's discretion. Therefore, the key to classification of same-sex sexual intercourse as a crime turns on analogizing it to illicit sexual intercourse between a man and a woman. As Abu Hanifa viewed it, homosexual desires leading to same-sex sexual conduct are distinct from heterosexual desires and conduct. 
uh, subsequently the mens rea or the, the mental thought of same-sex fornicator is different from that of his heterosexual counterpart and therefore he should be treated differently. Sentences for such crimes are a matter of tazir or punishments left up to the discretion of the qadi or the Islamic judge. Nevertheless, if we accept Abu Hanifa's distinction in mental states, we still must worry about the act in question as the majority of Classical Islamic jurists do not accept Abu Hanifa's distinction. They point to the unlawfulness of the sexual acts which take place outside the framework of marriage. Consequentialist in approach, they aim to protect the institution of marriage and family by punishing all acts, whether homosexual or heterosexual, that insult or inflict harm on this institution, which they strictly define as between a man and a woman. Whether such sinful act is actually harmful to the institution of marriage or offensive to it does not make a difference to them in terms of punishment as the purpose of the hat punishment is to deter all unlawful acts that are deemed to be socially malignant to Muslim society. The person engaged in homosexual conduct, whether married or not, is deemed to produce these ill effects. Okay. So now important to the development of Islamic jurisprudence on same-sex sexual relations are the rules of evidence and the theory of siyat or a theory of siyasa sharia as articulate uh, er, uh, as early as Ibn Taymiyyah in the 13th century. Okay, so I'm really taking you back. Uh, for they greatly expanded the prosecutorial powers of the jurists to achieve public order and morality. The diminishing reliance on the madhabs as a source of authority and the greater reliance on direct sunnah or the Quran and the hadith allowed the jurist greater prosecutorial power to punish hat crimes, including homosexuality. As Ibn Taymiyyah's classification of law compels the jurist to rely mainly on sunnah and not any particular school, the jurist, even if he had reason to distinguish homosexual from heterosexual conduct, as Abu Hanifa did, is bound by sharia to treat same-sex sexual intercourse as a had offense, as sunnah makes clear. However, moreover, as sources of authority relied less on opinion of Islamic legal scholars and more on sunnah, the jurist did not have to be a scholar trained in fiqh, but simply one who reliably understood the Quran and the hadith or simply by an agent of the state as the Muhtasab, who is a Christian and still work in Islamic law and action and most recently sheds and the regulation of sexual conduct, including same-sex sexual conduct in Mamluk, Egypt. Theoretically, the jurist was not only the classical judge, but also the administrator, the military officer, or the public official whose duty it is to, is to govern in the name of the sacred law. Along with this originalist redefinition of the sources of authority, which increased prosecutorial power, classical evidentiary rules required to punish hat crimes became less important than evidentiary rules required in the law of obligations and consequently provided the jurist greater procedural leeway to convict accused homosexuals. Under classical jurisprudence, to prosecute a hat crime, the jurist must have a confession, four eyewitnesses, or a refusal to take an oath by the defendant. Circumstantial evidence could not be taken in proving the crime, and the doctrine of shubha, or doubt, uh, or the shubha rule, uh, protected the defendant from doubtful convictions that rested on ambiguous facts or mental states. Moreover, as Barbara Johansson points out, uh, my former, one of my former advisors, I have a lot of respect for him, coerced testimony under classical jurisprudence was prohibited and the jurist who punished accordingly to this testimony was himself to be punished. These evidentiary rules, however, became less important as Abu Taimeh, Ibn Taymiyyah permitted the jurist to rely on coerced testimony, which I think we can even see today in you know, any short up police station in Egypt, in prosecuting hat crimes and allowed for circumstantial evidence as indications or signs against the accused, which we see in some of these forensic uh, tests that are even present in Egypt today. 
Theoretically, at least, hate crimes could now be more easily prosecuted in police stations where police officers could coerce testimony from the accused and convict them. In other words, the location of judicial authority soon met the location of state coercion. The importance of this legal change on increasing prosecution and the capacity of the police state becomes evident in the arrest, torture, and conviction, I think, of dozens of gay men in Cairo in 2001. Most importantly, Ibn Taymiyyah's vision of the Islamic State captured in this, in his political theory of siyasa sharia, I think has had a lasting impact on conceptualizing criminal law and prosecution as public or so-called social law in the Muslim world. A serious consequentialist, Ibn Taymiyyah envisioned political power to be a means by which Muslim jurists, who are in essence political religious leaders, can ultimately command the good forbid the evil. Political power for Ibn Taymiyyah was a duty placed on Muslim leaders to achieve in order for them to be able to govern in the name of the sacred law. In other words, Ibn Taymiyyah's jury is bound to prosecute and to punish socially aberrant conduct in order to maintain public morals and social stability if he is to govern against, according to a so-called perfect law in an imperfect society. Applying this concept of siyasa sharia, the jurist's primary duty when confronted with an accusation of illicit same-sex sexual relations defi defined as beyond the pale of accepted marital relations uh, is to maintain social stability and public morals. His concern for the rights of this accused person, person I think, are secondary to this duty and he leans towards punishment of doing so would maintain social cohesion and public morals necessary for him to govern. Um, his theory and practice of the socialization of the criminal law, where criminal procedural rights are secondary to political co governance and social stability, existed in Muslim society, I would argue, as early as the 13th century, making reception of colonial sodomy laws and prostitution laws inherited from the West, um, possible and likely uh, in the modern Muslim state. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to end my talk by speaking a bit about uh, this concept of, in, and skipping from the Mamluk period in Egypt and jumping, you know, I'm jumping the whole Ottoman period, 400 years of whatever, uh, I have one minute left, but uh, in the, 20th, in, the, in the 20th century, Duncan Kennedy, who is a professor at Harvard, who is also a mentor to uh, Professor Lama, uh, Lama uh, has articulated this idea and noticed this notion of the socialization of law in the 50s and 60s. Uh, so for Professor Duncan Kennedy, he articulates that Islamic law uh, was and had always been social, social in the sense of um, a progressive version. Uh, uh, he says the prohibitions to be relaxed were those, the prohibitions and laws to be relaxed were those on non marital sexes, for example, by decriminalizing female adultery, adultery and sex between unmarried persons. However, the authoritarian nationalist approach was very different. Uh, in the 50s and 60s under Nasser. Again, I'm really jumping. Uh, though no less so, the interests of the nation required the reform of the family in the interest of society, as in the progressive agenda, but the rhetoric was of protection rather than on freedom and equality. Um, in post-colonial Egypt in the 1950s and 1960s, social reformers like Gamal Abdel Nasser, uh, sought social reforms in endorsing equal opportunities for education and employment for women in the name of modernity, yet stopped short in the deregulation of extramarital sexuality and gender norms in a political power compromise, uh, some would argue with the ulama in favor of formal inequality under Islamic law, toleration of domestic violence and crimes of honor and the celebration of female virginity before marriage. Uh, through this happy compromise, authoritarian social reformers 
uh, like Nasser in the 1950s and 60s, could modernize their nations through labor and land reforms while maintaining social cohesion by regulating public morals and obtaining moral legitimacy from their domestic religious leaders and Islamic uh, legal traditions. However, I, I want to take a bit issue with this, uh, our Reverend Professor Kennedy. Uh, while this may prove to be a, a possible ex explanation, um, I want to point out that as Ibn Taymiyyah's theory of siyasa sharia, as illustrated what I try to describe, social order and public morality has always been part, I would argue, of the social consciousness in Islamic society as much as they have underlined underlied its laws. Uh, to deny this fact, I think, would be to ignore the centuries of, of our own traditions, social and legal, that have predated the most modern Muslim state and, uh, you know, and not really to appreciate that, what I argued at the beginning, the inertia that we're up in our attempt to articulate a new queer imaginaries. Um, again, uh, my attempt here was to try to, um, not to be, uh, paint a stark picture of what, uh, what we're up against, but uh, uh, I think we have to re-envision and rethink uh, some of these basic um, precedents that we've established in our, in our societies. And I think this is a great place to start doing, uh, to start doing this. All right, thank you.